Hello, I'm Dr. Ron England coming to you from Daytona State College and this is CEN 3722, Human Computer Interaction. And today we're gonna to continue on the series of human factors and we're gonna talk a little bit about automation. We've said a little bit about it before in our lecture on human factors, but now we're gonna go into a little bit more depth of what is automation? What are some automated systems? How do we use the automated systems? What are, when should we use automated systems? What problems can you have? But there's obviously lots of advantages. We're also gonna look at the concept of situational awareness because in automated systems, you have a specific and unique issues that you deal with when dealing with situational awareness. When we're talking about systems that the user really has to be paying attention to what's going on and what effects automation has on that. So first, what is automation. I don't think anybody's going to have any trouble with this definition. A machine takes responsibility for a task that a human could do, but a human is not doing. That's essentially it. You have a human operator that turns over responsibility for specific tasks to the machines. This is used everywhere, and actually its use is growing. So automated systems aren't just something that's brand new. They've been around for literally hundreds of years, and with new capabilities of what we've got with computers and more intelligent or capable machines, many things are moving towards automation, which does bring the users into a more, I say, a different role than they had. Instead of sitting there and doing some repetitive task over and over again, those get relegated to the machine, but, you, but the task for the human becomes more things, more of the things that humans are good at. So, Let's just look at a picture. This is a nuclear power plant. We're gonna actually talk about nuclear power plants here in just a minute. But this is a massively complicated system, a nuclear power plant. And humans are gonna to have to be able to operate these types of systems. So we're gonna look a little later, what's the role of automation and what's the role of human in this? But I want you to kind of get your head onto this concept that when you're dealing and designing systems, and you've got some pieces that are automated and some that are human, these can be very, very complex systems. So when do you create an automated system? When do you actually give the, the functionality to an automated system? Well, one of the obvious cases, and probably the most obvious case, is when you're dealing with something that a human simply cannot do. They cannot do it because it's way too dangerous. They cannot do it because it is way too complex, requires large amounts of calculations in a short period of time, which are things that humans aren't tremendously good at doing. So there's lots of different examples of this one, but that is an obvious case. We are gonna give that over to automation and then have the human operators take care of the portion that the humans are good at. Well, it doesn't mean that you have just that. Obviously, there are all types of systems that humans are quite capable of doing, but for various reasons don't want to do or are simply not going to do a very good job at it, and we can give those over to automated systems. Usually systems that have a high level of repetitive action or that are essentially what we call brain numbing, those are very good systems to go into automated, but just systems that allow the users, the, the controllers, to move on to other tasks, or ones that um, are essentially augmenting the capability of the user. So augmented systems are another type of system where you'd say, okay, let's move this to automation. Usually as an engineer in design, you're trying to move or migrate as much things to automation and away from human control as you can but at the same time, you also need to take into account what is the human controller going to be responsible for doing. Many things like putting the labels on an air traffic control system, okay, that is something that can be that is essentially automated. A human could go through the computer interface and stick all the different labeling systems on all the different things and color code them. But this is something relatively easy for a machine to do and allow the user, the controller, to take care of the more complex task or the more 
human-based complex task of ensuring the safety of the individual aircraft within the fleet because they understand with a you know good understanding of what is going on so automation problems this is a big deal what can happen in automated systems because not only do you have to design for the automation and building the automated system and designing an interface, you also have to design for what can go wrong. And what can go wrong can be more than just mechanical failures or interface failures. There's a whole field of things that can go wrong. So let's look at one of them, such as unreliability of the system itself. The component may fail, it may be mis programmed, or you may not just simply have trust in whether it's capable of doing what it needs to do. So let's look at an example, and this is one that you can look at. This is a very well-documented case study of the KAL-007 flight. What happened with K, uh, Korean Airlines 007 is it was shot down by Russia. This is, was during the height of the Cold War. It was a standard commercial airliner that was shot down. Now, Autopilot systems have been used for many years, and they've been used for many years safely. And I don't want to give anybody the impression that one thing failed and caused this disaster. Many things went wrong to cause this disaster, and any one of those one things not failing would have prevented the disaster. However, part of this problem was that this was a, this was a flight from Anchorage to Seoul, okay, which was going to pass within 18 miles of Russian airspace. Again, during the height of the Cold War, a little bit of an itchy trigger finger going on there. But the bottom line of one of the, or the, the, one of the basic malfunctions that occurred was a autopilot system operating in the wrong mode, which allowed the plane to drift. Now, there were many things that should have gone on to correct that drift, but those did not occur. What I'm really looking at is in the autopilot system, it was operating in heading rather than INS mode. INS mode would have automatically corrected. Heading was just simply going to go in a certain direction, but with a heading that was incorrect. Anybody who's done any type of navigation knows that a small deviation in heading over a long distance can cause tremendous num a tremendous amount of drift of where you end up as compared to where you think you're going to be. When you're passing within 18 miles of Russian airspace and there is the potential for a disaster there, but if you pass over the Russian airspace, that drift can be a problem. And in this case, it was. And the autopilot system did have an air with it, the, mo the modal air that was here. And there's a lot of good, and that's a very interesting case study, but it's worth looking at. But essentially, in this case, there was a failure of an automated system. So the trust of the automated system. How, when you're using any type of automated system, for you to use it first, you have to have a level of trust that it's gonna work the way that you want it to work. And that goes both ways, trust and mis mistrust. Any time that that system has been unreliable to you in the past, or has been unreliable to anyone that you've talked to in the past that has, met, that has told you that this system can't be trusted, is gonna provide a level of distrust to you. And this goes in many different directions. Just a simple understanding of what the system does. If you're using the car's um, con cruise control system, you have a knowledge of what cruise control does. Everybody, even whether, they, whether they've gotten into the guts of how a cruise control works, they still know how a cruise control works. You set a specific speed, you set the cruise control, it stays at that speed until you tap the brakes or turn it off. The operation is relatively simple. You know if it's not working. Of course, it'd be kind of a panic situation if the cruise control didn't come off when you tap the brakes. That would be a problem, and that would be a high level of mistrust, and of course, it would be very justified. But we know how that operates. Now, in the guts of the system, we may know not all the details of how that cruise control works, but we understand the algorithm. It's a relatively simple algorithm. Many types of automated systems are gonna be much more complex. But to trust them, you do have to have an understanding of the, of the algorithm itself. The other problem is the exact opposite direction. Overtrust, which may also lead to complacency. The system has worked so flawlessly for so long, 
what happens if it does actually experience a failure? Okay. What's happening is if you have developed too high of a level of trust and you've gotten complacent with it, you may not be monitoring the system when some sort of specific failure occurs. And this can be also catastrophic. Do you need to be able to detect that the failure has occurred? That's one side of it, but you also need to be able to deal with the situation of the failure because in many cases, an incorrectly operating automated system that fails can cause much more problematic failures on down the line if you don't know how to deal with it. Also, the concept of automation and workload. We don't want to put a tremendous amount of workload on any individual operator, but also we also don't want to have a workload that leads to what we call low level of arousal, which essentially says that you're falling asleep. You are asleep at the wheel, and even though the automated system may have nothing go wrong, if you're not aware of the situation, you might have another catastrophic problem down the line. Loss of human cooperation. Well, there's a whole lot that goes with this concept of humans either working against the system or humans not being able to have contact with other humans within the system. So an automated system where you're interacting with the automated system and not with a human system, that can cause problems. A human-to-human -human interaction in many cases allows for a level of understanding that can be conveyed through human voice and through just what you say that you're not going to get from a human computer-based system or a human computer automated system. And for those of you who've tried to dial support for any major, major corporation, know exactly what I mean. Okay, they're automated systems. They're trying to get you to the right person, but they're also trying to take care of your problem without passing it off to a human. And they almost always do a substandard job of it. Whereas if you were able to get with a human, at a minimum, they would get you to another human who would know how to handle the situation. So you end up with issues such as job satisfaction issues associated with automation. And it even goes back to the old etymology of the word sabotage, um, which is essentially saying that back in the days, the Dutch would throw their shoes into the machines to clog the machines up. Shoes were called sabots, so therefore the term sabotage. Not really sure if that's the true etymology, but it does sound pretty good, and it was in a Star Trek movie, so you know, that, that makes it real. Now, critical issues. Automated systems are just like any other HCI system. You need to design with the same type of rigor, constraints, and things that you take into account that you would with every other type of system. But in an automated system, you've got to put a couple other design parameters into play. One is, is that the humans may have a much more difficult time developing a mental model of the automated system. They have to have the ability to know what's going on. The, the concept of visibility still exists and is always still there. It's still a human perspective design. Now, some of the other ones that deal with this what if the system fails? This could be really large potential problems, and we're going to look at one of those large potential problems. But the ability to unambiguously and completely forthrightly announce that there is a system failure is extremely important in the successful operation and safety of automated systems. Let's look at an example. Three Mile Island, TMI. This is the control room at TMI, Three Mile Island. It's a fairly complex type of system. So uh, I worked as a nuclear engineer for uh, six years in the Navy, and I can definitely attest to the fact that these systems are incredibly complex. I can also attest to the fact that the operators who work on any type of nuclear system are incredibly well trained. We have many, uh, many systems that are automated and many systems that are underneath manual control. But let's go through a little bit of the TMI failure because there's a failure of multiple things dealing with automation that occurred in this, this case study. First, this started literally the day before. What happens is you've got these filters that are called condensate polishers, and they get gunked up. 
So what you do when they get gunked up is you clean them. And what you do to clean them is uh, typically you can either use high pressure water, you can use high pressure air, but you pull them out and you try to clean them so that the water then flows much better. So they're not gunked up anymore. This did occur. And what had happened in the process of degunking the, the condensate polishers was that some water got past one of the check valves. Um, high pressure water can actually squeeze around a check valve. A check valve is essentially a one-way water valve or a one-way air valve. They only allow, allow things to go one direction. But some of the water got past that and it got into some of the instrumentation lines. So this was an instrumentation air line. Water got into it. And what, it was, gonna, what was gonna happen when the eventually downside of what occurred here was this water getting into this instrumentation line caused the feed water pumps, condensate booster pumps, and condensate pumps to turn off. This occurred at 4 a.m. Okay. Now this in itself would not be any type of catastrophic type of situation because we've got protocols and automated systems in place to prevent anything from happening bad when the pumps go off. A little bit about nuclear reactors. Nuclear reactors are two loop reactors. Essentially, you take some sort of fluid and through what's called the primary loop. The primary loop is the one that goes through the nuclear reactor. Okay? It gets heated up in the nuclear reactor and it transfers its heat to a secondary loop. Okay? A secondary loop is the one that goes through either steam generators or boilers, or, um, um, or can, but it's essentially the loop that transfers the energy from the primary loop into turbines. So essentially, you remove the energy in the secondary loop and you create the energy in the primary loop and there's a heat exchanger between the two that transfers the heat energy from one to the other. It's a standard heat engine. I'm not going into heat engines, but if you're an engineer, you should have a very good concept of what a heat engine is, but it's a heat engine with two loops. Primary loop, water that goes through the nuclear reactor. Secondary loop, water that goes through the turbines. In this case, it was water. It can be any type of fluid. But pumps shut off. Okay, these are the feed water condensate boosters and the condensate pumps are shutting off. What do we do? Well, the first reaction, this is an automated system. If those pumps shut off, we scram the reactor. The scramming the reactor essentially says we put the rods down in the reactor and we shut the reactor down. But nuclear reactors don't just cool off immediately. The nuclear reaction actually continues. It just doesn't get out of control. As long as you keep water flowing through the reactor to keep things nice and keep things cool, that's what you're doing. Your reactor produces amount of, a little bit of residual heat, and that residual heat is then cooled off by the primary loop. Heat was being generated, and it was not re being removed at the same rate it was being generated, so the pressure began to build up in the primary loop. Well, we have an automated system in the primary loop, where you've got a valve that's going to open and release the pressure. Okay, the pressure began to rise, a valve opened up, okay, it was a pr pressure, pressure relief valve, and it was able to reduce the pressure. Now, the secondary loop was shut down. The pump, the, um, the, there was no flow going on in the secondary loop, so heat was not being removed that way, so there was, there was a problem with heat getting removed from the system. And the Failure, okay, was in the secondary loop, the valve that was closed to prevent the flow in the secondary loop needed to be opened, but in the primary loop, the, the relief valve didn't shut, but there was a flaw in the system. You've got this massive control panel, and in the control panel, you've got the status of all the different things that are going on, and because of the design of the pilot relief light on the control panel and the way that it was done, the control valve, the control, the, the valve didn't close, which meant that water was, by the way, still coming out of the primary loop, but it didn't indicate that it was still open. It actually indicated that it was closed. Okay, well, this is a problem because if you lose the water in the primary loop, you no longer have a coolant. You can keep the thing relatively cool just by keeping the water flowing within the reactor, but if you lose the water, you've got a problem. You're going to get a meltdown, which is why it did occur. So the users, the controllers, had been pretty much habituated. They knew, they, they you know, the light was doing what was going on, but, but now things are actually, you're getting a little bit of uh, 
problems with going, well, that light's on, but we're still, everything's too hot. What's going on? I mean, we should be getting flow. There should be enough water. Okay, well, the light misled them. Okay, they weren't, they weren't getting rid of the, the heat energy. Okay, the water was coming out of the primary loop. They did not see that there was still water coming out of the primary loop. Hadn't figured it out. Then the shifts changed. Well, the second shift came in, and actually they were able to figure out what the problem was. And there were ways to figure out what the problem was. If you're used to the light being on or the light being off, and it's telling you what you think it is, but even though everything else is indicating something is still going on, okay, but everything is normal, but something is still going on, you start looking for other things that might be indicators that something that you're being told is wrong. Well, there was something that you, were being, you could have looked at to tell you whether things were wrong. One was is that from the pressure relief valve, there was a downstream temperature sensor. That downstream temperature sensor was indicating that there was something going past it that was hot, okay? Which would tell the users, by the way, the valve that you think is closed is actually still open, okay? Now, the operators had not been trained for this situation, but this is an odd situation that occurs. I mean, you, you really have to understand these systems to be able to troubleshoot them. So this was a really challenging situation to deal with. Okay, the other problem was is that the temperature indicator, which could have told them that the relief valve was giving them the wrong indication, was actually located on the back of a seven foot high instrument panel completely out of their line of sight. They would have had to go over someplace else and look at it and go, oh my gosh, this temperature sensor doesn't mesh with what the pilot relief valve is telling me. All in all, you've got a number of things going on that eventually led to the meltdown. And, and you know, it, was, it was a major incident, but at least it was a completely catastrophic incident. In retrospect, the entire system itself was reviewed. The design of the solenoid and system for the relief valves, the design of the interface controls and the placement of the interface controls that the, that the users had. And remember, this is a, there's tons of indicators and sensors in a nuclear plant. Every valve, every temperature sensor, everything has an indicator. There are a lot of lessons that we learned from looking at this, but there are a lot of good lessons in HCI. So the violations of basic anthropometry, okay, you don't put something that might be an indicator of an unsafe condition in some place where people can't physically see it. Also, Noting that the displays that were, were positioned by, by function, not by proximity, essentially saying, and we're gonna look at that a little later, how to design the displays in such a way that things that go together should be together. The groupings. All these led to the disaster. Okay. Well, let's talk a little bit about situational awareness. And I think, again, everybody here is gonna understand what situational awareness is. This is being aware of the situation that occurs. Perception and ability to turn perception into some sort of meaning. And situational awareness is very important when you're dealing with automated systems because automated systems can lead to a lower level of situational awareness. Doesn't mean you shouldn't do automated systems. It just means that you have to come up with ways of understanding how to provide the operators and the users of your system to maintain at least a good level of situational awareness or a level of situational awareness that is necessary for safe operation. We have three levels of situational awareness. One, two, and three, or one SA, two SA, and three SA. Perceiving situations, okay, understanding the situations, and predicting the situations, one, two, and three. In nuclear power plants, operators are typically trained to have a situational awareness of level three, that they can actually do predictive analysis. If this occurs, this doesn't occur. And you can't go work in a nuclear power plant unless you've actually been through all these specific scenarios that are actually presented to you so you know what you're doing. That is part of the training associated with situational awareness. Good understanding that situation, the importance of situational awareness is, is key to designing these types of complex systems, okay? You know that automation is going to affect situational awareness. 
because you've got the levels of complacency. The system is doing what it needs to do. We're not playing an active role in understanding what's going on. Okay, the, ensuring that the feedback of the system itself, that the system that they're monitoring is what the user needs to know to maintain the level of situational awareness that is necessary for the system is important. So you have to have a strategy for developing and maintaining the correct level of situational awareness. Okay, and that might be things like um, indications of different parameters that you put forth. You might have specific tasks that have to be performed on a regular basis. We do this all the time in large-scale um, plant operations. We have things like checkouts that go on on a regular basis that actually let you keep a high level of SA as you're operating it, making sure that there are specific goals, but there, there's strategies to maintaining SA in automated systems. So I'm hoping that you, looking at automated systems, and automated systems is, is another thing, it's a huge field of study. There's hundreds and hundreds of case studies of dealing with automated systems and things that can occur, okay? But you know what automation is. You can give examples of automated systems, but most important, you understand the effect of automation and how it has an effect on the way users use the system, operate the system, deal with problems in the system, and maintain a situational awareness of the system itself. These are all key HCI elements in dealing with automation. Thank you very much, Dr. Ryan Eaglin, checking out from Daytona State College.